with the black pieces we have the magician from Riga Michael Tal a creative attacking genius who overwhelmed his opponents with spectacular sacrifices and brilliant combinations to this day no player has more games cited in chess books than Michael Tal. Just one year prior to this game, in 1960, Tal had shocked the chess world, breaking all records by becoming the world chess champion at only 23 years of age. When even the greatest chess players in the world sat down to play the magician, they knew that at any moment could come a bolt from the heavens, a stunning sacrifice of a piece, even the queen maybe, that would turn the game into a wild, creative, attacking masterpiece. Tal said that in chess you must lead your opponent into a deep, dark forest where two plus two equals five and the path leading out is only wide enough for one. Facing Michael Tal in this game was a mystery. Rashid Neshmedinov with the white pieces, a player we know very, very little about. And the things that we do know raises more questions than they answer. We know that Neshmetdinov had a rough start in life. His parents were poor peasants in the Tatar region, region of the USSR, and we know that he was orphaned as a child when his parents were literally worked to death. And we know that he played chess with a fiery passion for the attack that made even the great Mikhail Tal quiver. Nishmedinov was not even a chess grandmaster, yet he won every single game he ever played against Tal, except one. Maybe it's this one. Let's take a look. He opens the game with a pawn to E4. And I will call out every single move in algebraic notation so you can practice uh, practice visualizing the position if you want to just listen to the audio of this little video, this tale of this great, great game between these two great artists of the chessboard. Tal responded with pawn to c5, which is known as the Sicilian defense. This, of course, attacks d4, preventing Tal from playing d4. Therefore, he plays knight to f3, looking at d4, preparing to play d4. We see pawn to d6 from Michael Tal, defending against an e4, e5 advance, and Nesh Medinov plays pawn to d4. This is a standard Sicilian position, and we are going to see the open Sicilian, as Tal plays, c takes d4, just like this. Okay, so after we see c takes d4, by Tal, we are of course going to see Anish Medinov recapture with knight takes d4. The game at this point does not look magical, um, but uh, just you wait. The game won a brilliant surprise. One of the players did, I'm not going to say who. Um, so even though we are in kind of just a boring chess theory with standard moves uh, at this point that will 
change. Don't you worry. Tile plate knight to f6, looking at e4. It's a standard move in this position. So knight c3 in standard fashion defends e4. And we are now entering into what will become the Schwenigen or Schwenigen variation of the Sicilian defense with pawn to e6 by Tal with the black pieces here. Bishop to e2, making ready to castle and developing the light squared bishop and pawn to a6 by Tal. He is considering playing pawn to b5, pawn to b4, and then when this knight is kicked away, no longer defending e4, he can come in and try to attack e4 with the knight. Also, there will be room for a bishop here on b7, also looking at the e4 square. Still theory and still a very standard plane in a very standard position. Nesht Medinov castles. It's always nice to have a safe king. And we see queen to c7, standard development again in the Sicilian defense, in many variation, not only in the Schwenigen. Pawn to f4. This is, of course, still theory. Nishmetinov plays this move. But uh, it's not the only move in the position. And this is one of the more aggressive variations, of course. Trying to either support this pawn in coming forward or pushing this pawn even further and trying to activate the rook, maybe even before the Black Majesty gets cancelled. So things are heating up just a little bit. Just a little bit. Things are heating up. Knight BD7 by Tal. So he is um, focusing here on getting the knight out and looking at the center squares, uh, trying to stop Neshmetinov from advancing in the center. And he's doing this at the cost of moving the uh, dark squared bishop instead, which would allow him to castle, but would not help him defend in the center as much. And just you always have to weigh the pros and cons of how you develop your pieces in the opening. After knight bd7, we see something that's going to hint a little bit about how the map of the battlefield will be drawn in this game. g4, pawn to g4 on the ninth move here. So Nishmetinov with the white pieces plays 9, pawn to g4. So if f4, pawn to f4, was a bit of an aggressive move, then we can see that pawn to g4 is a very aggressive move, and it is, of course, double-sided. Is it really wise against the magician to re from Riga to have your king uh, exposed? Would it maybe not be more wise? to have the pawns back to a formal wall of your castle. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the game. Let's see what happens. It's a beautiful game of chess, this is. Ta does not react on this side of the board. He reacts on the opposite side of the board, and with the black pieces, he plays b5. This is the plane that we were talking about earlier. B5 is a threatening B4. This knight is currently the only piece defending E4. So, no, no spectacular sacrifices just yet. Instead, just pawn to A6. Pawn to A6 on the 10th move by Rashid. 
Nash Medina. So this is quite simply defending against pawn to d4. He does not want the knight to be dislodged. So how does Tal respond? Bishop to b7. A coordinating an attack with the knight on e4. So still Tal has prioritized um, stopping the center mass in coming forward and developing his pieces in such a fashion that he can attack the strong center of Nishmedinov. He has done so at the cost of castling his king, which is still on its starting square here in the middle of the board. Bishop to f3, simply defending e4. So white plays bishop to f3, defending e4, and putting the bishop here on a better diagonal. On e2, it was looking into these pawns here, not having a great future, and on f3, it is potentially attacking this other big bishop, or countering its influence at the very least, and it's looking at these two center squares. So a very nice and logical move here. Now, knight to c5 by Tal. So here he's uh, doing something that he was very fond of, and that is breaking principles of chess. In chess, you often say that you shouldn't move a piece more than one time in the opening, unless you have a very good reason. Some players interpret that to mean you shouldn't do it unless you are forced to do it. And why is that? Well, by moving this piece again, and we will talk about why he's doing it, why the magician is doing this, um, he is neglecting moving this bishop here, and we have talked about getting castled, that he is, he's not prioritizing that, he's prioritizing the center here. And now let's talk about why he would do such a thing. Well, bishop, knight, and now also this knight, all coordinating on e4. So, if Nishmedinov uh, doesn't do anything, well, he will come in and capture that. So he is forcing Nishmedinov to defend. Queen to e2 by white, defending evil. And now, by black, we see a strike in the center with pawn to e5. Still saying that I don't need to castle at this moment, it is more important to stifle any attack before it begins, instead of protecting against the attack when it comes. Is this wise? Let's see. So pawn to e4, again moving a piece two times. Of course, this was already on e6, had moved, now it's going to e5, not e4, sorry, pawn to e5. This is attacking the knight, this is attacking the pawn. And uh, here Nishmedinov, the mystery man, decides uh, to move in with a knight to f5. So this is the first piece that has crossed the center line here, dividing the two kingdoms. And this knight is now invading the magician of Riga's kingdom, the kingdom of the magician from Riga. This knight cannot be tolerated. So Tal decides to push this knight away. And by playing pawn to g6, and that's the way he's, he has chosen to do this, um, he's also making room for this bishop now to come 
here in what is known as the fianchetto position on g7 and then he could castle and all would be well with the world that is of course if the living mystery the enigmatic Rashid Neshmedinov chose to react and uh, move the knight but he didn't and this is this is where the magic starts to happen so the attack on the knight is ignored and uh, Neshmedinov is saying no you misunderstand me magician you misunderstand me I'm not going to react I want you to react I'm not going to defend anymore I want you to defend and therefore he plays f takes e5 which you will notice is attacking this knight it's starting to heat up now can we capture this knight so if in this position Tal chose to capture the knight he would lose his own knight and it would be very hard for him to find a safe place for his king as this file here is opening up and this pawn here on f6 would make a potential castling to the king side a very dubious maneuver so what happened instead just quite simply d takes e5 and uh, here we see the point we see the point this knight cannot stay here but it's not going to go backwards it's going to go to h6 knight h6 by Neshmet Dinov protected by this humble bishop who has not even moved in this game but is now an important piece nonetheless protecting this knight and some would say that a knight on the rim is dim that is what we teach beginners in chess so why would you put this knight here well it is making it impossible for black to castle to the king's side so maybe maybe tal is too late maybe his focus on the center of the board lingered a little bit too long and uh, maybe his king will never find a safe haven or maybe it will let's take let's take let's take a look knight e6 by black so this knight is uh, looking to get back into the game and of course this knight could come here with a nice attack on the queen on the bishop on this pawn it could come here also with an attack on the queen and blocking the communication between the bishop and the knight so we could come in and capture the knight so it's a very very slick move knight to e6 by tal here it's very very nice against this slick attacking move we see a little bit of a, a little bit of a mystery when we first look at we see bishop g2 by white Neshmedinov plays bishop g2 looks like a retreating move but really it's not really it's not because when the bishop moves back to g2 coming from f3 this rook here look at this rook is now looking at f4 so the knight can't really come to f4 we just chop it off with the bishop and there is a lot of complications in that scenario and also if we don't clock up this here and if we uh, if we allow this rook to have a view on this knight actually this knight can be captured and uh, 
So this sort of retreating looking move by Nish Medina of bishop to g2 is actually an attacking move, allowing the rook to see the knight. So bishop to g7, defending the knight. And uh, if you don't know the value of the pieces, the way we usually talk about this in chess is that we, if we count the pawn as one being the weakest piece, then the knight and the bishop, they're both, both a three, which is really amazing actually because they move in so like such a different fashion, but they are almost exactly uh, equally good, depending on the position, of course. And uh, the rook is better, it's five. And you can tell why, because it can go as far as it wants, just like the bishop, but it can hit all the squares on the chessboard, where the bishop can only hit the squares on the color complex where it starts. So, of course, the rook is better. The queen is worth a nine. King does not really have a value, although we would say that in the end game it could have a fighting power of three, three point five, maybe. So, therefore, in this position, uh, it may have come as a great shock for Tal to see what Nech Medina played. Because despite this knight just being defended by this bishop, Nezhmedinov picked up his rook and captured the knight. And that is what we call an exchange sacrifice in chess. An exchange sacrifice when you sacrifice the rook for what we call a minor piece, and a minor piece would be a bishop or a knight. In this case, it's a knight. And bishop takes rook, of course. And now the kettles have started boiling. Now it has not just heated up, now this game is simmering with excitement and creativity and we have entered a completely unique and beautiful position but um, who will prevail from this because it's not obvious that this exchange sacrifice is justified look at this rook here all the way on the back rank not participating in the attack how will we how will we actually, as white here, make a checkmating attack to justify sacrificing the exchange? Also, this bishop, it's in the game a little bit, as it is defending this knight, but it's blocking this rook from entering. So it's not really clear what's actually going on. Knight to d5. Not getting the rook involved. No, Nishmedinov plays knight to d5. This is attacking the bishop, and it is attacking the queen. And there are two ways you can go about this. You can either play bishop takes knight, or you can do what Tal did, and play queen d8, which gets out of the attack of the knight and it defends the bishop. So is that what you would have done as well or would you have played bishop takes knight where we would have seen pawn takes bishop and this knight or this bishop rather here would be very very strong looking potentially at this rook this pawn would be attacking this knight but we wouldn't have to deal with this extremely strong knight here. Which is best? What do you think? What, which is best? Queen f2. By white. Queen f2. Coordinating an attack here on f6 with the knight. Oh, oh that's a big problem. And it's a big problem because we also have this knight on h6. So you can't move the bishop, because then you just get checkmated on f7. 
queen takes f7, that would be checkmate. So, how to deal with this? Well, how about the resource that Tal prepared earlier? What was the resource that Tal prepared earlier to solve all of these problems? With a slick move. The knight came to e6 so that it can now come to f4, knight f4, blocking the attack from the queen to the knight, blocking the attack, or the, rather the defense from the bishop to this h6 knight, and really sort of clocking up the avenue of attack against Tal's king. He cannot castle, however. So he would very much like for this knight to be gone, so he could castle his king to safety. But he is really fighting back here. And uh, I'm curious to see how it goes. Bishop takes f4 by Nishmedinov. Bishop takes f4. And e takes f4 by Tal. So now this knight on h6 is no longer defended by the bishop. Hmm. But since we had, uh, or since white rather had sacrificed the exchange on f6, the bishop had been lured out here to f6, so it will have to spend a move coming back to g7 to chase the knight away. But we may be getting there. We may be getting there. Maybe what's going on here? Maybe. Can this be true? Rashid is helping that. Because he's playing e5. Which is almost saying, oh, you can, you can just defend your bishop by going where you want to go anyway. Go back to g7. But it's not quite that simple. And this actually has all to do with this bishop back on g2. It's actually looking at the bishop on g7. So if you go back here, hmm, attacking here, the problem is that the knight can come in and check knight f6 check yes you can capture it with the bishop but it's defended and now you you don't really have time to come in and capture it with the queen because you will then lose this bishop here and there is a lot of variations there that I invite you I invite you to check out for yourself because they are beautiful and uh, in short form, basically, black will be losing in that variation. Which is why, in this position here, that we didn't see bishop g7, we saw bishop capturing on e5. Bishop takes e5, but king is exposed here and can't castle because of this pesky knight looking at g8. So rook to e1. Excuse me. Yeah, rook to e1 by Nishmedinov. Pinning the bishop to the king. And now, every single one of Nishmedinov's pieces is doing something very active in the attack. So the last piece of the puzzle, the last piece in the attack. F6 is played to protect the bishop. But of course, knight takes F6 with check and you can't capture that with the bishop because you are pinned to the king. So 
Lishmetinov plays knight takes f6. Check. And Tal plays queen takes f6. So now this pawn is still protected and the bishop is still protected. If we could just castle, how many times have you said that in a chess game? Oh, if I could just castle, my position would be excellent. And um, the weak point besides the king here is the e5 bishop here. It can't move because it's pinned. And uh, that weakness really stems from the king being weak, Tal's king being weak. Queen d4. Uh, looks a little bit iffy, maybe. But remember that you can't actually, black can't come in and capture this queen. Can't do that. Because it's pinned by the rook. Notice that we are not seeing something like bishop takes bishop. That's not uh, what this game is actually about here. You can look at the variations yourselves, and I, I suggest you do. It's a beautiful game, very hard to understand. But of course, these two players were, well, mag magicians and wizards and artists, both of them. King to f8 by Tal. So he's finally saying, I get the king out. I'm never going to castle now. Once you move the king, you can't castle. He's never, ever, ever going to castle, but maybe he can castle by hand. By going to g7, the rooks would be connected, and everything would be kind of fine there. Kind of fine there. So king f8. But rook takes e5, winning a bishop. Yeah. And this actually comes with a big threat as well. Kind of interesting tactic. So, of course, this sort of relationship between these bishops where this bishop can come in and capture here that's not the biggest threat actually going on here the biggest threat right now would be this rook to f5 because the queen looks like it's hanging but you can't capture the queen because you hang your king and I mean, if you try to protect your, your queen from this queen, like something, I can capture it with the rook. So it's just about that Tal is going to lose his queen here, but he plays queen, d8, queen back to d8. And now again, no time for a bishop captures here because queen takes queen. Hmm. And there's a, there's a tactic here that I, I really like, and it's not... You can probably find it. So it's it's just leaving the queen here. Of course, if queen takes queen, that will be check. So can't really allow that. And it's not queen takes queen. Which, given how much uh, Lishmedinov has compromised his own pos uh, position to get this attack going, uh, it's actually not uh, going to be a sound way to continue from here so there is a tactic here that is that i think you can maybe you can find we actually already looked at the move uh, and it's not the most advanced thing that nishan matinov had ever played it's not the most advanced thing that tal had ever seen or played himself but it is quite nice it is this uh, rook um, rook f5 check so no time to, to take the queen and of course it is uh, in quotation marks sacrificing the rook but the idea is not it, it, the idea is not so advanced so g takes f5 forced and queen Queen takes h8 with check. Only one legal move. The knight taking away f7, so king e7. There's not going to be any queen takes queen. Rather, queen g7. King cannot go back. Queen f7 would be checkmate, so the king has to go forward. And now, 
still leaving all of this and uh, we have g takes f5 check nicely protected by the knight and in uh, this position i'm going to show you the rest of the game but in this position tal did resign but it may not be obvious as to why so i will show you uh, both how Nishmetinov uh, is now forcing a way to win his queen and i will show you how that will also lead to a forced checkmate so actually there is not a, a lot of things that you can really do here as uh, as black you only have one legal move which is king d8 and we start out by winning the queen we're actually going for checkmate with knight f7 and this is of course check the king will have to move and we will win the queen you could stop the game there but there is a forced mate i will not show the longest sequence which is in six moves here i will show a simplified version of it because it convey conveys the idea in a more precise way so in this position king does not go back to uh, allow a discovered check from the knight cannot go to the light squares because of the bishop and also actually cannot really go to the dark squares so in this variation here it's just one of many they are all forced checkmates we see king to c5 knight takes the queen as an example rook takes knight and queen c7 check you can interpose the bishop it doesn't make a difference difference i'm just going to capture it because i am defended by this here so well, let's just do it bishop interposes just postponing the checkmate for one more move queen takes and a very beautiful finish this forces notice the king cannot go here because of the pawn so this forces king to d4 and can you find checkmate in one this is a crisscross checkmate um, and it's exploiting this bishop here so queen to c3 checkmate reminiscent of some 400 year old games of the italian master greco so that is the end of the game this was not the game that tal won um, let me know if you want to see more of the encounters between these two um, great great players these great artists and uh, let me know if i should if i should cover the one that uh, the tal won or if i should do more like this where i don't tell you who won the game uh, and you'll have to figure it out on your own um, so thank you very much for watching i hope you had a great 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 time and relaxing time and i hope i will see you in the next video thanks for watching <laughs>